Shakespeare writes tragedies, Shakespeare writes comedies. Every once in a while, Shakespeare writes a play that we're not sure falls into either category, and in this case, it's called a tragicomedy, and that's exactly what The Tempest is. The Tempest is one of Shakespeare's shortest plays, and also possibly one of his last. However, it's still a classic, and as one of Shakespeare's only plays that appears to be completely original in terms of its story, it's an essential part of the Shakespeare continuum that can't be overlooked. Among other things, there's a common scholarly theory that Prospero, the main character of The Tempest, is in fact a representation of Shakespeare himself, and that his final farewell to his magic at the end is also representative of Shakespeare's final farewell to playwriting. Then again, since the bard's not exactly around anymore, we can't straight up ask him, so I guess that'll have to remain in the realm of scholarly theorization. And with no further ado, I present to you a summary of The Tempest. The Tempest begins, shockingly, with a tempest that results in a shipwreck, leaving the ship's passengers stranded on an island. Of the people shipwrecked, these are the only important dudes. There's Alonzo, the king of Naples. He's kind of a big deal. There's Sebastian, Alonzo's younger brother. There's Antonio, the Duke of Milan. He's a bad guy. There's Ferdinand, Alonzo's son, and the Prince of Naples. He's also going to be this story's Romeo, so keep an eye on this one. And then there's Gonzalo, an overall swell nobleman. There are also these two guys, Stefano and Trinculo. Stefano is the drunken butler of the king, and Trinculo is his jester. They're not really important at the moment, and they won't be for quite a while, so you can just ignore these while they go and get stinking drunk some. But it turns out they're not alone on the island, as we cut away to two seemingly unrelated people, Prospero and his daughter Miranda. Eyes of the blue Now Miranda's freaking out because she saw the ship in the storm and thinks that many sailors must have died. But Prospero reveals that he actually conjured the storm with magic, which apparently he can totally do. And he ensured that nobody died. In fact, the ship is perfectly intact and hidden in a secret harbor. Now Miranda's like, but dad, why'd you have to strand these people here? And Prospero's like, well, that's a long and complicated story that I really should have told you at some point in the past 12 years. So it turns out that Prospero was once himself the Duke of Milan and Miranda was basically a princess. But Prospero was too busy reading books, studying, and being scholarly in general to fulfill all his tedious government duties, so instead he let his brother Antonio handle all the government work that he was avoiding. But Antonio had greater ambitions and persuaded King Alonso that Prospero should be exiled, specifically set adrift in a tiny rickety boat to die. So not really exiled at all, I guess, just murdered in everything but name, and that Antonio should take over as full-time Duke of Milan. Apparently, this plan sounded fantastic because King Alonso was all for it. Gonzalo took pity on Prospero and his then three years old daughter, supplying them with food, good clothing, and books from Prospero's library. Of course, if the movie version is to be believed, Gonzalo seems to have primarily focused on that fine clothing aspect, seeing as these people are not at all dressed like castaways whose last set of clothing was for someone 12 years younger than they are. Sure was nice of Gonzalo to include the essentials of their survival. They drifted ashore, and since then, Prospero's been raising Miranda all by himself while simultaneously being an extremely powerful sorcerer. Strange Strangely, he never took the time to teach any awesome magic to Miranda, or even a basic knowledge of the outside world, but whatever. Now, since every single one of the names in that story sounded remarkably familiar, we can all see where this is going. Prospero stranded the ship because it was carrying the two men responsible for his exile, and he's clearly got some nasty revenge scheme cooked up for them and their loved ones. Sure enough, Prospero summons his fairy servant Ariel, who is most certainly not Puck, asking him to separate the stranded noblemen so he can deal with them more easily, and specifically to bring the king's son Ferdinand to him. Ariel, in turn, asks to be freed from his servitude, and Prospero refuses. What a swell guy. On the grounds that Ariel's last master had been way worse than Prospero, Prospero, an evil witch named Sycorax, whose primary contributions to the world at large included a nasty devilish son named Caliban and a totally kick-ass Doctor Who villain. Speaking of the devil, we are introduced to Caliban, who Prospero orders to go and collect some firewood. Oddly enough, Caliban initially seems like a moderately sympathetic character. He's an unwilling slave to Prospero, a man who initially acted as a friendly father figure to Caliban and taught him of the world, only to turn around and use him for manual labor. Of course, Caliban stops being at all sympathetic right around the time where we learn that he tried to rape Miranda. So yeah, kind of a deal breaker. Anyway, Ariel leads Ferdinand to Prospero and Miranda, and Miranda immediately falls head over heels in love with him, primarily since he's the first attractive man she's ever seen in her life. Prospero, meanwhile, begins to put his dastardly vengeance plan into motion, in which he arranges for Ferdinand to fall in love with Miranda. <laughs> and then he wants them to be happily married so that they can all return to Milan as one big happy family. Ha! Trope subverted! Bet you didn't see that one coming. Turns out the mean old wizard guy's not actually that mean. He just really wants to make sure that his daughter will have a good future. So his plan is as follows. He's going to make Ferdinand and Miranda fall in love with each other so that they'll want to get married. Then he's going to essentially stress out Ferdinand's father the king so much that he's just gonna be so happy to find out his son's really alive that he'll take them all back to Milan out of gratitude. And this is why he couldn't free Ariel, because he still needs some magical help in order to make all the pieces fall into place. And this is one of the reasons why The Tempest is such a unique play, because there's an actual character 
that's essentially taking the role of writer and stage director, because Prospero's the one moving all the characters around and having them interact the way they are. Of course, he's also just basically being a puppet master like a lot of characters, but this is kind of like what would happen if they wrote Lord of the Rings from Gandalf's perspective. A version which I would totally read, by the way. So he pretends like he thinks Ferdinand is a spy, and he's like, Miranda, I absolutely forbid you to fall in love with this man. And Miranda's like, oh, daddy, please, can I keep him? And Prospero's like, Miranda, this man is the son of our hated enemy. He's the worst of the worst. And Miranda's like, well then, dad, I guess I must have really low standards. So Prospero's like, all right, fine, he can stay with us as our servant, but only because you totally forced my hand just then. Meanwhile, elsewhere on the island, poor King Alonzo is super sad because he thinks his son Ferdinand must have drowned in the shipwreck. And while he and the others take a nap, Sebastian and Antonio decide to murder him so that Sebastian can inherit the throne. Fortunately, Ariel is there to wake the king up before they can go full Macbeth on him. Over to Caliban. He's off collecting firewood and sulking about his servitude when he runs into these two drunk guys named Stefano and Trinculo. See? They're kind of relevant. Who proceed to get him stinking drunk. He decides to worship Stefano as a god since he thinks he must have fallen from the moon. Yeah, I don't really get it either. I think this is the comedy part of this, uh... Anyway, back to Ferdinand, who's working as a servant for Prospero. He and Miranda have this beautiful little conversation about true love and all that. So they confess their love to each other and resolve to get married whenever it's possible. Prospero does a little victory dance that his well-intentioned scheming has worked out so properly. Back to the Three Stooges over here, Caliban's explaining to the other two about how nasty and evil his master Prospero is and suggests that they all go and murder him. After all, what else is a lazy Saturday for? Back to the other shipwrecked nobleman, Prospero's been having his spirits troll him for a little. First, they make a fancy banquet appear out of nowhere, and then Ariel vanishes all the food and accuses the king and his partners in exiling Prospero of being evil. I have made you mad. Man, Shakespeare really loves banquets that go horribly wrong. King Alonso continues to mope, and Sebastian and Antonia resolve to kill him that night for sure. Prospero gives Ferdinand permission to marry his daughter. Shocker, right? Prospero sends Ariel to go and collect the others so they can witness the happy couple, then he summons a bunch more spirits to pretty the place up for the new visitors. But then Prospero remembers that Caliban was totally gonna try and murder him. Fortunately, his would-be assassins are total idiots, so he and Ariel just string up some shiny clothing to distract them, and Caliban's accomplices prove to be magnificently bad at staying focused for any extended period of time. And this is what happens when you get comic relief to do a tragic character's job. Finally, the cast is reunited. Prospero reveals to Alonzo that Ferdinand is totally still alive, gives Gonzalo a great big hug for saving their bacon all those years ago, and presumably as a thank you for all those fancy dresses he must have shipped with them, and casually mentions to Sebastian and Antonio how he could have them executed for treason at any time. You know, just food for thought. When Alonzo learns how Prospero and Miranda survived, and more importantly, how Prospero's daughter and his son are suddenly engaged, Alonzo insists that Prospero and Miranda return home to Milan with them so the happy couple can be officially married. Prospero finally sets Ariel free, everyone's friends again, and there's a great big happily ever after. Except for Caliban, Stefano, and Trinculo, who seem to remain stranded on the island. And for that matter, Antonio and Sebastian don't really get a resolution either. Nah, I'm sure it's fine. Oh, and Prospero also gives up all his awesomely useful sorcery and magical powers because magic is bad, kids. Ah, computers are stupid.